Ready? Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome here to our first issue briefing of day three of the Summit on the Global Agenda 2015. A warm welcome to you joining us in the room and a warm welcome to you watching us live online at weforum.org. Now, this is a, a fairly crucial time to be talking about climate change as uh, there are some rather large talks looming um, in early December in Paris. And I'm very pleased to be joined by an expert panel who represent a breadth of expertise and knowledge across a whole range of climate-related issues. As you know uh, from previous issue briefings, we don't have long to cover very, very complex and uh, interesting discussions and challenges. So I'm going to keep my minutes, moments here very, very short, but I'm going to ask my panel here to say a few words, answering a few key questions, and then we'll take questions from the floor and from social media. First of all, Cheng Wa Wu, uh, you're a member of our governance, Meta Council on Governance for Architecture and the Council for Governance on Sustainability. You're also director, Greater China for the Climate Group, based in the People's Republic of China. Perhaps you could give us a, your view on the roads to Paris so far. Thank you for having me. And in six weeks' time, the global leaders will be gathered in Paris with all the negotiators, different parties. I think the momentum is on, uh, that everyone is trying to contribute to the process to make sure the international process will remain uh, active uh, so that we have that sort of foundation and platform so everyone could come together and you know, figure out how to solve the global challenges of climate change issues. Uh, in the last couple of years, particularly this year, and if you look at the momentum building up, you know, the INDC intended nationally determined contributions, the sort of bottom-up actions, uh, we pretty much gathered the majority of them already. I think I, I haven't checked the number this morning, but at least yesterday there were about 164 nations already submitted. Uh, their commitments actually to the Paris process. If you look at uh, business community, there are more than six million companies already committing to all kinds of sustainability goals. And if you look at the subnational governments, actually, they're also committing to join the leagues. So this momentum is on that offers the optimistic mystic sort of view that uh, no matter how difficult the international process negotiation will be, but somehow the willingness, the desire to collaborate is on the table so that hopefully in six weeks time or seven weeks actually, we're going to really reach a certain agreement at least actually at the starting point to really work together to address this issue. Many people are also say, would this say be enough? I think we, if you look at it, all the INDCs by different countries put on the table, definitely it's a far off from the two degrees Celsius, the target, the international agreement, uh, the community agreed in Copenhagen, but somehow uh, from my personal view, I think it's a good starting point. I think we need to create a sort of incentives mechanism in the international process to make sure countries will aim high. And uh, so at least actually we're going to have something coming out of the Paris process. I think that's a good starting point to work with. I mean, just reading the papers, it's, it seems that everybody wants this to succeed. Uh, uh, Ten uh, Catholic bishops signed a letter in the, in the paper this morning. There are vast numbers of business groups, as you mentioned, signing, signing pledges and, and cooperating. And yet, talks aren't without the bumps in the road. There have been uh, disappointing talks in, in Bonn just in the past couple of days. So is it possible we'll, nothing will come out of these talks? I wouldn't really. I think, I think the international negotiation process is always complicated uh, because it has to take into consideration all kinds of proposals from different countries, from different interest groups. So that's normal. I don't think that to say, oh, it's complicated, then we're going to fail. Rather, I see that as a normal process. I think if you look at Bonn, and now we have something like 34 pages with a lot of brackets, actually uncertainty included, rather than this nine, you know, shorter version, nine page shorter version, uh, that's going to be submitted actually to the Paris process. Uh, that tells about a couple of things. One, uh, it won't be easy meaning there are still a lot of uh, you know, proposals, the interests, and uh, people desire to be included in the, in the Paris process. In the meantime, actually, if you look at the details, so if you, you look at market-based instruments, if you look at uh, uh, you know, different elements actually being included, you know, expanded version, I do not see them as necessarily a bad thing, a negative thing. It's more like I say, we need to consider all those different elements and so make sure somehow we include them and so everybody will be willing to join the league actually to take actions rather than say, okay, I'm gonna only take into consideration those interests, those elements while ignoring the others actually. So I definitely see that as a positive, constructive process even though it's difficult. And, and, and I guess an interesting um, uh, comment to be made was, was made yesterday in our sustainable development session, actually, when I think, I believe it was David Victor commented that the, the, the talks that have just um, 
completed in the UN mm -hmm. regarding the Sustainable Development Goals were actually a, a sign that diplomacy is now sophisticated enough to handle these multilateral challenges, big treaties such as Paris. It's going to be a big test even so. Uh, well, as I said, the multilateralism actually uh, has been very bumpy uh, in terms of addressing global challenges. And we've seen that in particular from the Copenhagen process around the climate change mm. issues. I think that the, the international community, people recognize and say, yes, multilateral process actually would be necessary, but that won't be the only way actually to solve the issues. Rather, besides that piece of the multilateralism actually on the table, more and more so actually we're going to see more bottom-up inputs from you know, different uh, subnational governments, business community, different sectors. Only by combining actually those sort of forces, elements together, there, there, there will be a hope actually to address this issue. Thanks very much. Lars Josephson, you're a professor at Brandenburg University of Technology in Germany. You're a member of our Decarbonizing Energy Council. You've been very busy over the past, uh, past months in the council, putting together guidelines and, 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 and a report um, outlining the state of play and, and, and offering a path forward for decarbonizing. What are, your, what are your views? What do you want to see happen um, in, the, in the realm of technology to decarbonize the energy? Yeah, let me, uh, glad you mentioned the report which we issued here. The white paper, Scaling Technologies to Decarbonize Energy, was uh, released uh, yesterday, uh, which I think is uh, hopefully gives a great picture of what is possible from the technology point of view. Um, it is our deep conviction that uh, we will never be able to handle uh, the climate change issue without uh, technology, new technologies. Uh, so this is a must. But then if we, if we take stock of what has happened over the last, last years, uh, and I think somebody, some people think that we have moved very slowly, uh, I, would, I would take the other view because if you look at solar and wind, for instance, we moved fantastically rapid. We, we, uh, we have uh, achieved a lot in the last 20 years. And why is this? Well, this is because it's been a political will. Uh, why has that been a political will? Well, because it, it's, really, it's really uncontroversial. There is uh, the public understands, and, uh, and it's a political uh, backing, a will, and it's easy to say, and then most, most politicians say, and by the way, you customers, you will pay. So, so, so there we have achieved a lot in the last 20 years. Unfortunately, this is not the only thing we need to do. So the more complicated things have been then pushed to the back. And, and we raise those uh, uh, in this report because there are clearly areas where, where it's much more difficult uh, because looking at electricity, uh, we need decarbonize base load uh, electricity. Uh, unfortunately, solar and wind is not base load, it's intermittent uh, electricity. Uh, if we should get decarbonized uh, base load electricity, we have to uh, have a renewed look, look at nuclear, for instance, which is in many parts of the world a very controversial issue. But as we point out in the report, it now seems actually realistic uh, that we can move relatively rapidly into the fourth generation of nuclear, solving most of the problems of the present generation. That's one example. Another one, uh, which is also controversial, uh, because that's, that's called uh, CCS, ca cap carbon capture and sequestration. Um, that is very effective to use together with coal plants. But many people are religiously against coal plants. So it's a controversial issue. It requires huge investments to get down the learning curve because it's too costly. Uh, if we look at the um, transportation sector, uh, of course we need to get out of, of the, uh, uh, the, the, the fossil fuel as, as, a, as a feedstock for, for that engine. But of course when looking at um, advanced biofuels, we need to invest much more in technology, come down the learning curve, and get, uh, and get the price down. Uh, if, we, if we don't fix that price difference, it will never happen in, in, in that sense. Um, but uh, that can be done. We probably need a new pricing model, a new tax regime maybe, uh, which is very effective. 
of course, on the transportation sector, we have the, the uh, electronic vehicle coming. But there, um, you have to allow also the technology development. Uh, we, we need to get to the next generation of batteries. But that is still five years away. And uh, people believe it will happen tomorrow. It will not. Uh, and we probably will need another generation before, before everyone can have an electronic vehicle. So we speak about time scales. And, and we, need, we need actually to educate politicians and ourselves that the expectancy uh, of, of what to be achieved in what time frame is to our advantage if we understand it. But if we understand that, we can actually manage the future. And then the problem is suddenly much more manageable. And if we can get out of Paris or, or out of a club of nations or whatever, concerted efforts into these areas of technology, I, I think we, we, we will actually be able to uh, speed up the fight, uh, the fight against climate change. And it's really worthwhile because the money you put in here is much less than the money you put in in different subsidies today. It's an interesting point. Um, and I, I suppose one could think that the petrochemical industry has had 100 years to optimize itself. And we're asking wind and solar to optimize itself in, in 20 or, 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 or less years. But even so, with the technology we have at hand and the, the, the timeline horizon, we need to get these big projects like CCS, like advanced nuclear, up and running. I know uh, my home country, the UK, has been discussed at the moment in, in, the, in the context of a 10, 20 year program. Do we have enough on the table right now to make a, a meaningful contribution to the goals that are going to be discussed and hopefully achieved in, in Paris in December? In my opinion, I think we can have um, uh, the, the fourth generation of advanced nuclear commercialized in 10 years, which is a very, very short uh, time period. And if we can then have uh, multiple nations and companies involved in this, we could, we could also scale up relatively quickly. So in, in the timescales we're talking about, this is incredibly fast. But, but that, uh, I mean, the basis to do that would be a concerted effort in many countries working together with many companies at the same time. Daniel Zarin, you're a member of the Forestry Council, and you're also the director of programs at the Climate and Land Use Alliance in the USA. What do you want to see happen in Paris and, and going forward, possibly outside of Paris in a separate process to protect forests in the world? Well, thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, very interestingly enough, the, the topic of forests has, has probably gotten more progress in the international process than, than um, many of the areas that are seen as more in the mainstream climate agenda. There's been a very uh, effective development of the, the rules, um, the processes, the safeguards around an initiative that goes under the heading of reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, so-called Red Plus. Um, so the, the, the architecture is largely there. There are big issues in Paris with forests as with other issues around finance. Um, and there are uh, questions around the, the timing and, and so on, but we do have in place a uh, remarkable, really, example of cooperation uh, between developed countries and developing nations in terms of uh, partnership, working together, developing that, that process. Now, um, is, that, is that enough? Um, it's certainly not enough for us to uh, realize the potential that exists there for reducing uh, emissions from the, the sector. If tropical deforestation were a country or a region in terms of emissions, it's about equal to the European Union. So this is a very, very significant source uh, of emissions and one where there are real opportunities to achieve uh, reductions in the near term and achievements that actually have proof of concept. We've seen in, in Brazil, for example, probably the largest single uh, emission reductions of any nation over the past decade occurring with respect to the drop in deforestation in the Amazon basin by uh, almost 80%. Um, and, and the demonstration in the proof of concept that that can happen at the same time as agricultural production has gone up in the same region, essentially closing the frontier, uh, stimulating intensification of production. 
Um, so we have very effective examples. And at the same time, though, we have real crises going on in the world. The, cri the climate crisis of this year is going on right now in Indonesia. Uh, we have, uh, this is above and beyond that European Union size uh, emissions. We have, um, for the past six to eight weeks, emissions uh, from fires in Indonesian peatlands that are on a daily basis equal to the average daily emissions, or really above the average daily emissions from the entire US economy. Um, as of last week, reaching the amount of emissions that are coming annually from Japan have occurred just from, from these fires just this year. Uh, these are fires that are caused by uh, illegally set, um, land, illegal land clearing that's um, done for the expansion of palm oil or wood fiber production. Um, they're terrible fires because they're occurring on peatland that as part of the land preparation is drained in order to make the land adequate for growing those crops. And that drainage means that peat, which is really, geologically speaking, a precursor for coal, um, is, uh, is very ignitable, particularly in years like this one where we have very strong El Ninos. Um, and the fires burn underground. So they really can't be put out until it's rained for a while. Uh, so we have a very, very serious situation in terms of climate that at the same time and even more immediately is causing the worst public health crisis in Indonesia since the 2004 tsunami, affecting tens of millions of Indonesians and, and uh, citizens of neighboring countries as well, billions of dollars in cost to the Indonesian economy. Um, but even there, we, we now have uh, a very, very, very interesting uh, leadership emerging from the Indonesian president who um, has put forward uh, some steps that are really unprecedented um, in that country. Steps that are, first of all, confronting the immediate crisis. Uh, secondly, um, imposing very serious accountability on those who have been responsible for the, the fires. And thirdly, putting forward policy to uh, to really address the underlying causes. So even in the past week, uh, President Joko Widodo has been uh, announcing a comprehensive moratorium on the clearing of peatland uh, and a major uh, commitment to restoration of peatland, including blocking these drainage canals to re-wet these areas so that they won't be able to ignite, cause a similar catastrophe in the future. Uh, so we see we see challenges, but we see response, um, uh, proactive responses, examples from, from major uh, countries that are, that are um, significant uh, greenhouse gas emitters as their economies are growing. And uh, they're, they're making progress towards uh, uh, growing their economies in ways that are um, climate friendly, that address the uh, the really what need to be looked at as kind of twinned goals of food security and climate security. And you have best practices emerging in Brazil, and you have uh, an ongoing crisis in Indonesia, albeit one that looks like it may be turning around, but is this a global governance issue, the fact we don't have, a, we don't have uh, an architecture in place to, 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 to stop this happening elsewhere? Well, it's a, it's, it certainly is a governance issue. Um, it's certainly a governance issue at, at the national level and subnational level in the countries that are to, to whom these forests belong. Um, the, the global governance side of it is, um, is one in which we do see some progress in terms of the, uh, the global community essentially acting to reinforce governance at the national level. So uh, perhaps the best example of this that we have now is around the illegal, uh, uh, the illegal timber trade, where in uh, both Europe, the US, and a growing number of examples um, in importing countries, we have the architecture of very strong laws that, that place um, burden on the, on the importers to ensure that, that the product that they are importing was produced, harvested legally in the country of, of origin. So it's not imposing any kind of mm -hmm. sort of global uh, or, or a foreign standard on the producing country, but rather reinforcing uh, national law. That seems to be uh, growing in effectiveness. The, the EU has a very significant and important program in the area of forest legality, governance, and trade. Um, in the US, just this past week, the 
the largest suit was just settled against a large company called Lumber Liquidators, in which they've pled guilty in this area. Um, so there is, we do see real progress on that front in, around the trade issues as well. And uh, important areas to develop further and that we see with attention um, in, uh, in China, where, where there is growing attention to this issue around legality and really a need for, um, for the uptake of at least a kind of analogous structures around, uh, around importation in China, since China is really a kind of the world's major hub of import and subsequent export in terms of uh, taking in raw materials, uh, processing, and then exporting uh, finished or semi-finished wood products. And I'd like to come back to that and talk about China and emerging markets in general. But first, Carl Ganser, you're the managing director of Circle of Blue based in the US and a member of our Water Council. What do we need to know about water as we, as we head towards Paris? Well, everything. Um, so I'm a journalist, and I was in uh, COP15 in Copenhagen, and you know watched the, the talks unfold, but also watched it from the journalist perspective. And the story was really hard to enter. It was a very complicated issue, as we all know. And so uh, a, a pack of very interested reporters with very complicated stories to tell. Well, the good news and bad news is, is that now we have the water story. We also have much more visible changes. I mean, right now we have the big story in Indonesia that it's a story that we can tell. So on the waterfront, over the last really eight years, we've seen some transitions um, as far as thinking goes. So it used to be just talking about water supply, water for food. Now we're talking about a water nexus, a water, food, energy, climate nexus. So you, you have this interconnection between all four. And in a sense, a mantra that we're really in our council and you know, across the water world are talking about is you can't talk about one without talking about the other. So let me tell a little story from Inner Mongolia. So we do a lot of, a lot of work you know, in scenario sessions and whatnot, but I like to get out in the field. And so I went to Inner Mongolia, one of the epicenters for climate change, the big open pit coal mines, Shilling Hot Inner Mongolia, and wanted to just to see, you know, what do these places look like? And so I found a shepherd family, and uh, I went to their home, and their wells were going dry. Their wells were going dry because of the coal mines, right? The six coal mines, some of the largest in the world. And the next day, the family took me out to their gur, their little their yurt out in the prairie in the grasslands. And I got up at sunrise and hiked up these little sand dunes. Now these are the these are supposed to be the grasslands of the world. These are little sand dunes that we're standing on. I'm watching the sunrise. And the daughter comes out and stands there and she's wondering where I disappeared to. And uh, so we watch this and we see the sand, and then the next evening we go into town and there's a performance um, of, and it's a beautiful video of grasslands, et cetera, and I, I type out on my phone, my Google Translate, because I don't speak Mongolian or, or Chinese fluently, and I say, can you take me there next time, these beautiful green grasslands? And she turns pale white, and she, set, she types on her Google Translate on her iPhone and says, is no longer, and I say, why? And she says, not since the disaster. So right now we're seeing water as, in a sense, the front, one of the frontline stories, one of the most important stories in this nexus of water, food, and energy. And we're also seeing uh, on, the, on the waterfront and in the journalism world, we're always looking for the next story. And the next big story is groundwater. And it's almost like climate change. It's very hard to grasp because we can't see it. But now we're starting to see the impacts of that in California and in North India, even in, in North Africa and other parts of the world. So. You know, how are we going to feed our population when we're drawing on groundwater supplies because our snowpacks, say, in the, in the American West, in the Sierras, are at 4 to 6% of historical levels? So we have, from the journalistic perspective, a big story unfolding that we can finally see. So the optimistic side of that is that when we can see the stories, we can act on them, and we can move the public to act better, and we can move beyond uh, very ethereal concepts of carbon trading, which we all understand, but is very hard to tell as a story, into what this actually means to people, whether, it's, whether you're a Native American uh, community in Arizona or whether you're a farmer in Punjab. Quick whiz around the, the room, if any questions? Okay, well, let's just, 
go back to looking at the, <coughs> the, you know, the, the path forward, and, and please feel free to make comments. Emerging markets are going to be key to uh, grappling all of these issues of forestry, for new technologies, for you know, keeping you know, economies gunning, uh, gunning along, but at the same time being sustainable, not making the same mistakes that advanced economies have done in the in previous industrial relation periods. For water, what are we seeing here? We're also seeing you know, bringing back to the real world, you know, the, the economy is slowing down in many of these markets too. What, what kind of level of complexity and difficulty does this add to the whole process? Uh, a couple of ways of looking at it, particularly I work in China, so uh, the China, I think China's story is a sort of good reflection of the complexity, uh, you know, on the positive and also probably potentially on the negative side there as well. Um, I think after Copenhagen, the international process basically, one thing actually Copenhagen did is really the awakening uh, of the international community among the different countries, among the society about the climate change risk. So it's recognized as a major global challenges. So that sort of awareness exists today, even though there are still climate skeptics, whatever, but I think the majority actually uh, tend to agree that climate change is a big uh, issue. Uh, China definitely uh, has become, uh, become became the largest emitter in 2007. And since then, actually, if you look at it, say we continue to be the largest emitter. And if you look at the absolute contribution on an annual basis, actually, the new growth of em emissions, China contributed to about more than half, actually, of the global emissions, which is really a saddening situ you know, story. And uh, it's a huge burden on this sort of a, the, the, you know, the largest emerging economy in the world today, rising to the second largest economy today of the world. And so on one side, of course, we need to grow because it's a developing country. And so people need to get better life, quality of life, wealth, whatever. On the other side, actually, we have to deal with actually global challenges like climate change issues, which is also linked to actually to air pollution, environmental issues, challenges in China. So that's where China has gradually coming out of the situation, basically saying, OK, uh, this is the reality, particularly because actually the society, the public does not like where we've been you know, where we were, and we need to figure out the way out. So the momentum building up in terms of addressing, you know, domestic challenge, but also global challenge, interesting enough, China is a showcase of the alignment, a perfect alignment, actually. It's not just addressing carbon issues, rather we have to address, actually, carbon issues, energy issues, water issues, food issues, forestry, everything, actually, together. Uh, so if you look at China, China's commitment to the international process, we said for the first time, finally, we said we're going to manage to peak their emissions no later than 2030. Uh, in the plan, if you look at the details, actually, not only say capping the emissions, but also say how do we achieve that? So we are putting more emphasis on you know, energy efficiency, renewable energy, clean technologies, uh, you name it, we pretty much pull together. It's not just addressing the environmental issues, rather this is how we're going to grow our economy differently, uh, away actually from where we've been actually in the last three decades or so. The, the lessons we learned actually, and uh, basically saying, okay, what have ever happened in other developed countries over the industrialization process, uh, we cannot carry on like that. We re exactly repeated the mistakes. We said we call them mistakes. That's why we ended up where we are today. So now is a critical moment, you know, sort of driven by all the momentum globally, domestically, issue, we need to shift. Uh, so that's where China is today. I think that's properly set the example for other emerging economies as well. Say we cannot just talk about it, say your mistakes, whatever, we're gonna not to compete, repeat, but rather we need to take actions and trying to figure out then what the way actually we're gonna to really take it differently. It's not only say just for the environmental issues, but really most importantly how you know the economic growth you know, coming out of the recession in particular. Uh, so I think, it, I, you know, I said, it's a setting to see a lot of negativities are actually the difficult challenges in, re in reality, but I feel very, very encouraged by the determined sort of, you know, political leadership in China, particularly for this, this generation of leaders. If you look at, a, you know, we say, okay, we need to shift the gear towards the sustainability. I think China is today actually a good example for the international community, particularly for other developing countries. Say, let's really do this together, and China is going to try to set an example. Hopefully, we're going to shift towards sustainability rather, you know, following the, tr the track of industrialized countries. And last, presumably, great leapfrogging potential for emerging countries to, to adapt and adopt new technologies. Uh, absolutely, uh, I wanted to, wanted to raise a special. Uh, aspect of it which we discussed and, and uh, worked out a concept in our um, in our council and that is looking at the people who doesn't have any energy access at all or very uh, unreliable because there of course 
number one priority, they, they should have energy access. Number two priority, they should have decarbonized uh, energy access. And uh, our concept was that if we look at, at the individual household and let uh, and the products and technology, uh, products not, but technologies are there in actually to give them affordable energy access. The problem is that there is no market. And the problem is that uh, until now there's been no way to accumulate the demands of millions of households. But if we can do that, we will create a market big enough for big, uh, big companies uh, to develop customized products for that household. And if, and, and if we do that, interestingly enough, we create an energy access module. And you can, you can make the comparison with a piece of Lego. Because then we can add the Lego pieces, and suddenly we have a bottom-up, very strong energy system. And uh, I think that, to me, this is an intriguing possibility that we would like to push forward, because we know there is a lot of goodwill, and this is part of all international organizations, because the energy access people for the low-income people is, is a great problem, or a big problem in the international negotiations. How do we serve these people? Or how do we enable them to empower their own future? I was going to say, that's exactly the one of the same issues we're dealing with in our council on the water side, is how do we provide access to clean and safe drinking water? And we've made huge gains in that side in looking at water and sanitation globally. Um, and one of the risks is we've made huge gains, but now we're faced with climate change. So we really do have to, we have to manage our water much more with much greater innovation and also with much more entrepreneurship um, on the ground. But, you know, there are a billion people on the planet, I'm rounding up, but that don't have access to safe drinking water. And when we bring access to safe drinking water and we, when we provide that water security, we provide much more stability for, you know, just geopolitical stability. Dan, what are your views yeah. here from a forestry <clears throat> perspective? Uh, I think it, it, you know, f as, as we look at these issues, it's, uh, you know, st and step back from really even just the immediate crisis, the climate change crisis, and, and recognize where this comes from, right? We, we start from a, a need to understand that we live in a world that is characterized by major market failures and governance failures across the board at all levels. Um, in the, and, and to address this, this crisis that we're in, it's not just about governments. And there is an enormous role for private sector to be playing, enormous roles for civil society to be playing in this space as well. Um, in the forest space, and, uh, the private sector has been playing a very interesting role that's really grown over the past few years, uh, particularly with uh, companies that, have, uh, that are in the supply chain business, that, are, that are, uh, have huge demand for agricultural commodities as feedstocks for their businesses. So there's consumer-facing companies, um, the agricultural uh, commodity trading companies, producers of these products and there's really just a handful of products that are the major um, uh, commodity drivers of deforestation responsible for for uh, the, the major part of deforestation globally um, and we've seen a wave of corporate commitments uh, to no deforestation commodity supplies this began this process began over over 10 years ago in brazil it's accelerated um, recently in the in the palm oil business in southeast asia and is um, creating whole new structures to try to, uh, to ensure transparency, traceability around um, these commodity crops. And th that's what's part, of, part of what's really needed to address the market failures so that when, a, when uh, major companies like agricultural commodity traders are, are looking at what it is that they do in the world, which has historically been uh, based on providing a, a high quality grain, say, at a cheap price everywhere in the world, providing really not only a core for their business, but actually a public service in, in doing so. Now they need to actually, uh, and they're stepping up and recognizing that, that inherent in that grain are the conditions of its production, that, that what they're selling is not just the grain, they're selling the, the uh, conditions, the social conditions of production, the environmental impacts of production, 
and that in the 21st century they cannot hide because as, uh, in another aspect of technology growth, everywhere on Earth is readily visible all the time from high resolution satellite platforms. There's, there's open access um, to them now developed uh, uh, by a number of civil society organizations working together on those platforms. So we have the opportunities for different kinds of governance as well as uh, addressing the market failures. Overall, what we, when we look at the emerging economy issue, um, what we're fundamentally saying and what, what, what they are fundamentally uh, saying, the ones that are taking on leadership in this area, is that the, the development paradigm um, that the uh, northern countries have developed in actually is, has got a shift if we're going to really be able to have sustainable development. We have a, a historically trodden development paradigm that has essentially has natural resource depletion, conversion of natural capital into other forms of capital as the base of, the, of development uh, uh, at, at national levels, local levels, and globally. That needs to change because we, we, uh, we cannot sustain that. Certainly the climate cannot sustain that. There are feedbacks into water cycles associated with clearing forests that go well beyond uh, the carbon cycle issues affecting climate globally. And we need to shift from seeing the natural resources as, as conversion capital to feed economic growth to being viewed as natural capital, natural assets that need to be looked at as the basis of services and products that sustain the global economy. And we could talk at length on this as a fascinating su subject. And we're running over time, but I, I, if I may, I'd like to just ask you to stay behind for one or two more minutes and, and just and, and look at this problem through the lens of the unofficial theme of this meeting, which is the fourth industrial revolution, which is looking at you know, the, the, the innovation, the, 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 the invention that, uh, that is going to have a huge impact on the, the, the new landscape that is unfolding before us. What technological innovation do you think is going to have the play, play the biggest, largest role, have the most impact in your field, Carl? Yeah, a couple of things. I'll ask each of you to yeah. answer that question. A couple of quick things. I mean, just to pick up on that, our, our measurement, accountability, and transparency, um, and also value, valuing water. Uh, what do we grow and where? Uh, agriculture traditionally uses 60 to 80 percent of the world's water. So, again, that's a, that's a key point. How do we feed? How do we feed the world? But how do we measure that water? And we have new satellites that can estimate groundwater. We have river flow data. Now we can actually allocate uh, water for the, for the highest use. And we can also predict, we hope, droughts and floods better. And also one more thing too on the conservation side. When we look at, uh, at water use, we look at desalin desalination, investment on that side, oftentimes uh, the best investment is in conservation up front. Done. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I would second the, the vote for technology that has to do with transparency. Um, so, so in the in the forest world, that has to do with uh, with satellite technology and the the processing capacity, information management uh, technology for that information, as well as um, information technology more broadly and, and knowledge management to bring the uh, the vast and growing amount of information down to the level where it's it's available on anyone's smartphone, so that a indigenous person in South America or in Southeast Asia can be uh, reporting on illegal logging, get that up on a global platform in real time and spur responsiveness to, uh, to issues as they're happening on the ground. Lars, it's a difficult one for you because you, you look at all technologies, but which is going to have the most impact, do you think, in the coming, uh, coming 12 months, 24 months? Uh, 12 months and 24 months is nothing when we speak about the energy system of the world. But, mm -hmm. but I, I'll, I'll um, I take Where will the we see most progress? I, I, I take the question as the, more, more the progress that, or the most hope, and I, I would uh, dis disregard the time respect. But I would say first, um, energy storage, that is batteries. It's fantastically rapid development at the moment. That will continue. Uh, secondly, I would say, the, uh, which has dawned on me actually in the process of this council, is the realistic promise of the next generation of advanced nuclear. Uh, third, uh, maybe unexpected, I, I would say the um, commercialization of the use of CO2. 
I, I tend to stay away from any one particular technologies. I think technologies are progressing, continues to, to progress. Uh, in, for addressing climate change issues, the weakest link today in the coming short term, mid term, long term actually is the systematic infrastructure redesign that will be able to accommodate actually the plugging of all different technologies actually in order to energy smart or you know whatever the te technologies are out there in order to really capture the potential the energy productivity which is today is the weakest link so i i'm not worried in particular about technologies if i have to pick the second point is say i probably will pick at this moment the energy storage look at the landscape actually of you know smart solutions the telecommunication technologies energy technologies and uh, uh, logistics or whatever uh, rather than talking about the fourth industrial revolution I think China today actually is more looking at the third industrial revolution mm -hmm. and in that landscape in order to address climate change issues actually the fundamentally as I said is the systemic infrastructure redesign that would allow the plug-ins of all the other technology uh, places and in it actually technology wide is energy storage Fantastic. Well, you guys have got a, got a lot of work to do. This is the last day of the summit, so we must close here. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for watching online. Thank you very much for joining me on the panel today. Thank you. This Thank session you. is now closed. <laughs>